Ah, how many of you guys have heard of the rotator cuff before? A few people? All right, we got this and one, this and one graph, and we'll go to lunch. Sound like a plan? So your rotator cuff muscles. They're your sits muscles. How many of you guys have heard that? This creates a little acronym for you guys to memorize the rotator cuff muscles by. And if you memorize them in this order, it does help. It does help. I'm going to show you guys how you can make this, this becomes a graph that's really easy to remember. First thing you got to remember, unfortunately, is the names. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. Make sure you know teres minor. Subscapularis. Now I remember the first time I learned these muscles. The names kind of freaked me out. Supraspinatus. Sounds like a dinosaur. Right? The supraspinatus. No? Or maybe I took that a little too far. But nonetheless, these names do tell you where the muscles are located. Remember I said anatomy is just another language, so let's break this word down. Supra sounds like what? Superior, spine, spine, spine. What bone are we on? Scapula. Does the scapula have a spine? It does. So the origin of this muscle is the supraspinous fossa. What's, what's the layman's term for fossa? Who wants to come up with it? We got bone bump for tubercle and tuberosity. I like that. What's a fossa? It's not a hole. What's a <laughs> that, <laughs> that's a foramen is a hole. Um, a fossa is like a, a depression, an indent. Yeah. So this depression right here right, is the supraspinous fossa, which just happens to be superior to the spine of my scapula. Makes sense now, right? All right, so your supraspinatus runs in here, goes underneath your acromion process, and it attaches into the greater tubercle of the humerus by running across the top of the humerus. If it goes from the top of the scapula on top of the humerus, number one, what joint are we talking about? Shoulder. So we still using the same word bank. That hasn't changed, right? We're still talking about the shoulder. We're still using the same word bank. If it goes from the top of the scapula to the top of the humerus like that, what do you think it's going to contribute to joint action-wise? It does like one of these puppies. Yeah, it contributes to, especially the initial part of abduction. This is an abductor. Infraspinatus is in the infraspinous fossa. What was the fossa again? Indentation. Infra probably sounds like inferior. inferior spine. Spine. So this actually has some of the origins and insertions. You guys can come up here, like on your breaks and lunch, and look at some of this. This infraspinous fossa is all this. And so the infraspinatus goes from the back of the scapula to the back of the humerus. What's it going to contribute to? External rotation. Teres minor, I don't know if you guys can see this. This is probably the easier way to look. Can you see how the teres minor and the infraspinatus kind of blend? Right? The teres minor definitely comes off the lateral border of the scapula. It doesn't 
it doesn't go all the way over here like the infraspinatus does, but they kind of blend and go in the same direction, which means they probably contribute to what? The same joint action. They're both going to do external rotation. Give you guys a little cue for your tests. If you remember your rotator cuff is your sits muscles, as we're doing up here, it externally rotates. You guys with me? It externally rotates, which only leaves us one muscle, subscapularis. What does sub mean? Below. All right, so what's weird about this picture right here? You see the bottom picture that points to subscapularis? What's different about that picture than the one above? It's an anterior view, which means who's missing? Scapula's there. The ribs. I heard somebody say it. The ribs have been removed from that picture. You are looking at the subscapularis from here, right? Subscapularis is underneath the scapula. So it goes from the front of the scapula to the front of the humerus. What type of rotation? Internal, right? Now you're on front, so it turns it this way. Does that make sense? We have the two muscles in the back that pulled us this way, the one on the top that pulled us this way, and then the one in the front that pulls us this way. At least it's on the front of the scapula. Now a little aside, just to teach you guys a little bit about muscular function so you understand why you're learning all this stuff. The interesting thing about those, the rotator cuff muscles is yes, those are the joint actions. And they'll actually do some other joint actions as you get more into advanced kinesiology and you start talking about some other things that'll do, but that's not the primary function of the rotator cuff. To call the glenoid fossa, which we were talking about earlier, right? This part right here, the shoulder socket, is a little unfair. Why is that? Does that look like a socket to you? Does that look like something the humeral head is just totally buried in? This is what's supposed to be giving our shoulder stability? It would be a better analogy rather than calling it a ball and socket to call it a golf ball and tee joint, right? Like, that's about how much support the humeral head has. So who keeps the humeral head on my glenoid fossa? Yeah, so what ends up happening is the rotator cuff comes along and goes, okay, we'll put one in front like this, we'll put a couple around the back, we'll put one on top to make sure we hold you in. So from a training perspective, what happens? Well these muscle fibers for rotator cuff and all of our stabilizing muscles are mostly type 1. What are type 1 muscle fibers? Slow twitch, Slow twitch. fatigue resistant, right? There are endurance fibers. So how do they want to be worked? Probably a little bit slower, yeah, probably a little bit slower tempo, but most importantly for a higher rep range. This is in our 1 to 6 rep range. This is our 12 to 20 rep range. And if we really want to get sophisticated, we'll do 12 to 20 reps at a slightly slower tempo. And since we know we're working on stabilization, we'll work on progressing exercises over time to more and more instable environments. So getting off of machines, going to like dumbbells, maybe stuff on a stability ball. You guys have seen some of this stuff? Now that's really, really important. But how many people do you know, especially athletes, enjoy endurance training? You don't see it very often, right? What do, they, what do all athletes want to do? Get big and do power training. They want it fast and hard. That's it. Right? One to six reps. How much can I lift? How fast can I lift it? And then I'm going to rest for three minutes. Well, that's great for your prime movers. But who gets left behind? Yeah, you're stabilizing slow twitch fibers. I will never forget, I was, used to play ball against this guy in my 
complex, and he used to play Division II ball. Guy was probably about 6'6", six, six, right? Probably outweighed me by 20, 25 pounds. So he was up there at around 250 pounds. Dude was a beast. Beast, big boy, right? Just every time I went and played against him, I was like, oh, I'm gonna hurt tomorrow, right? And I'll never forget, we played for months and months and months, and he happened to actually work out at the gym that I was a trainer at. And I would watch him work out a little bit, but I'm not one of those people who's gonna come up to you and tell you everything that you're doing wrong or everything that you're doing right. You go and work out. You want my advice, you can come up and ask me. But I did happen to notice with this particular guy, he spent a lot of time on machines. He could lift a truck, but he spent a lot of time on machines. And then there was a period where I didn't see him for a while. I didn't see him down on the basketball court. I didn't see him in the gym. The next time I saw him, he's in a sling. I'm like, dude, I know what he could do to me. I'd hate to see the guy who could do that to him. <laughs> right? Like, that was my first thought. But then I went over and asked him, I was like, what happened? And he was like, I threw an outlet pass. I went, what? You guys know what an outlet pass is, right? Well, he's a big enough guy. He can take a basketball and do this and just chuck it. And he said he literally went like this and dislocated his shoulder. So what had happened? Right, right? Like, so I'm starting to put all this together. He's been working his prime movers, getting huge. But his poor rotator cuff is like not getting any of the work it wants. It's not getting fed the way it wants. I guarantee this is what happened when he threw that ball. He saw that outlet pass, knew he had to make it quick, right, and powerful, probably beeline it, right, so he could get it there on time. His prime movers went, ah, pulled on his humerus as hard as they can, and his rotator cuff went, nah, screw this. <laughs> right, like, and he dislocated his shoulder. That's how that happens. And meanwhile, all he really had to do was some stability work. It's not like he needed to be any bigger to play basketball. Six foot six, 260 to play rec ball, you're big, right? Like the little stability work, he wouldn't have ended up in a sling. Does that kind of make sense on how the rotator cuff works? Do you guys kind of understand why you need to know your functional anatomy a little bit too? All right, let's do this one graph, reverse fly. So it's kind of like and a seat belt. Yeah, kind of like a seatbelt. I like that. Rotator cuff's kind of like a seatbelt. Reverse fly. So your reverse fly, all you guys are going to do is fill it in just like you filled in that graph. Right? You're going to fill in what plane of motion is a reverse fly in? Transverse. Good. We'll kind of do this one together since you guys haven't done one of these yet. We're going to do quite a, quite a few of these graphs. What joints are involved in a reverse fly? So my shoulder joint. And if my shoulder is involved, who else is going to be involved? My scapula. Right? So those guys move together. Anytime you guys write shoulder on any graph that we do, you need to write scapula too. I want you to think about them as two separate joints, though. You don't write those in one box. But anytime you have shoulder, you're going to have scapula. So shoulder, what joint action is occurring at the shoulder? Horizontal abduction. Then we'll go down to our next box and we got scapular retraction. retraction. All right, so I got shoulder abduction. What muscle is responsible for shoulder, shoulder abduction? It's a muscle that we've gone over to this point. Posterior deltoid. Good. What muscles are responsible for scapular retraction? Rhomboids and mid traps. We've already done that one before, right? So, the nice thing about learning these graphs, guys, is anytime scapular retraction comes up, who's involved? Who causes scapular retraction? Rhomboids and mid traps. If I say scapular retraction, 
for a seated row. What muscles are responsible? Rhomboids and mid traps. If I say a bent over barbell row with scapular retraction, scapular retraction is caused by rhomboids and mid traps. You guys got it? All right.